Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to CellPip Live. Today, we're going to be tackling uh, a writing task for the CellPip test with our expert, Brandy. But first, we're going to do a little bit of uh, trivia today for you. So our trivia question for this uh, episode of CellPip Live is, which province is in the exact center of Canada? So if you were to measure Canada from side to side, split that number in half, where which province would you land in? If uh, anybody has any guesses, feel free to share them in the comments. And uh, let's jump right into things with Brandy. Hello, Brandy. Hello, good morning. How are you, Neil? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm excellent, thanks. You know, I was thinking two things first off, that when I got out of bed this morning, I saw snow on the ground outside, which was a bit unusual for, for Vancouver anyhow. Mm -hmm. And also today is already the last day of January. Can you believe? I know. We're moving right through it. Yeah, time has really flown. So I'm glad that we've been able to do one self Pip Live episode in January. We just snuck it in. So I'm very happy to be here today. Right under the wire. Yeah. Right under the wire. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so I do have a writing episode to get into. So I'm just going to pull that up on my screen there. Can you see it okay? Yeah, we've got you live. Perfect. Okay. So yes, like Neil said just earlier, we are going to jump back into some writing today because it's been quite some time, I think, since we've given any made attention to the skill. So we're going to focus specifically on writing task one, which is all about writing an email. And before we look at our, our practice test question today and start typing away, we're going to talk about how an email should be properly structured. Part of your score when you're writing is knowing how to actually paragraph your work how to organize your ideas on the computer screen. So we're going to introduce today's episode by doing a quick review of email format. And then we're going to look at a real cell pit test question. We're going to write an email together in response. So I am going to be asking all of you to share your wonderful ideas with us today in the live chat box here as we go along. And then after we've written this email together, we'll take some time to proofread it. We're going to revise it to make sure that it's as good as we can get it for practice purposes. So before we jump right into that practice writing, I wanted to remind us all that there are four skill sets, we'll call them, or categories that the raters are looking for when they read over your email that you're submitting on the self test. So you can see these categories listed here. We won't have time in this episode to walk through every single point on the screen, but I am going to pick and choose some of the important ones today so that we can really focus those skills and improve our work. So as I said, we'll start with what's called readability, and we're going to have a quick five-minute conversation about what it takes to actually format the email and paragraph our work. So in order to do this, I'm going to show you a, a sample test question that I think is probably a bit familiar with a lot of you. We use this exact question on our free practice test that you can access on the website. So you may have seen it before, but I wanted to show you what the computer screen looks like, first of all as you write this test so you know where to find details you'll use to write. So we always start off by reading the left-hand side of the screen. This will give you the background information you need to understand, and you'll likely be drawing a few of these details out as you start to type your answer. So just to paraphrase here, this question on the, the sample test we provide at the website, it asks us, or it tells us, I guess, that we had a dinner at this nice restaurant, but our food and the service was terrible and there was not even a manager around, so we had no resolution. We left very unhappy. So understanding that, we would then move our attention, I guess, over to the right-hand side. So this is where you're going to find instructions on the test that tells you who you're supposed to write to. This test question says to us to write to the restaurant manager, and it reminds us that we have 150 to 200 words to do this. Now, right below that, this, these are the important points that are going to guide your writing. So oftentimes you'll see three bulleted details, sometimes you'll see four even, but you absolutely must include details to address all of the points you see here. That's another way to earn top scores for your email, to give a very complete answer and to address each point in turn. All right, now the trick is, here you can see in the bulleted details, you're first of all supposed to complain about the food, secondly, complain about the service, and third of all, we're asked to actually ask the restaurant manager for some sort of a solution. So you would come up with your own details as you're writing. But what I don't want you to do, not ever, not on the cell pip test or even in real life, never do this. You can see here what looks like it could be an email, 
At the top, we see, dear restaurant manager. At the bottom, we see regards and a name. So it's a loose email format. But what we've done here is we've taken every single detailed point and we've crammed them into one paragraph. This is not proper writing structure at all. Every single time we have a different main idea like this, there are three main ideas in front of us. We have to include those details in a separate paragraph. So instead of writing like this, what we should be doing is writing something like this. So we've got four paragraphs here. I know there were three bulleted points from the test, but when you look back at your, your email structure, we do have to make sure that we're following the proper format. So the opening paragraph there up top, in your first sentence of your email, you're probably going to take some of the ideas from the left-hand side of the computer instruction screen, the background information. So if you take a quick read there at the top in paragraph one, you'll notice that we're identifying the restaurant where we dined, who we went with, so that's an introduction. And right at the end of paragraph one, we've come up with our request for a solution. So here we're actually asking for a refund for the money we spent on that awful meal. This was that third bulleted point, if you remember from the test instructions. So we've already covered that detailed point right here in paragraph one. Your email usually introduces your topic up at, at the start and always has a purpose statement. So the reason for the writer to be sending this. So why not actually ask for our solution right up top? That would be the purpose. Second paragraph talks just about food and it gives some very specific examples of terrible food that was served. We would come up with those details from our own imaginations. The third paragraph here talks about the awful service. And again, we've invented some very specific ways that the service was awful. And your concluding paragraph, the last one here at the bottom, it's usually quite simple in the sense that it's really going to just summarize what you've been talking about and very likely in this case, emphasize what we want done. So you notice up top, we asked for a refund. In our conclusion, we've asked for a refund again, but we've just used different language. We've said, please reverse the charges to my credit card. Your concluding paragraph in an email as well should oftentimes gives a, a next step or a future action. And I think in this situation, it just makes sense to provide our phone number in case the restaurant manager, of course, wants to get a hold of us. And then you can see that we've signed off at the bottom. So this is just a, a quick introduction to your paragraph structure. We must somehow separate our details and organize them by main idea. When you do it this way, you make the reader's job so much easier because they understand where one idea begins and ends and then where the next idea begins and ends and so on. So organization here is definitely better. So when you're given your test question, when you're writing your own self pit test, before you start typing away at the computer, I'd recommend you take even a good minute of time. You have 27 minutes in total. So take about a minute to start and just consider the main points that you're going to have to talk about in the email itself and try to envision what it's going to look like on the computer screen. Decide how many paragraphs you're going to use as you're writing. So I'd like to present to you now the, the question that I'd like to actually write with us as a group. And I am going to be asking you shortly to share some of your ideas here in the, in the chat box. So again, we better start by looking at the background here on the left. I'll read it out loud if you don't mind, just so we can all stay together for time here today. So the situation is, you have been having problems with the windows in your new apartment. They often let in city noise and cold air. These problems are causing you a lot of discomfort. So we now look over here and it says, write an email to your building manager in 150 to 200 words. Your email should do the following things. So once again, we see three bulleted points. The very first thing says to describe the problems with your windows and then explain how the problems are affecting you. And lastly, explain how you would like the problems solved. So at some point within our email, we have to address all three points. We also must come up with very specific examples to support all of these details. And that's what we're going to do next. So I think that first bulleted point at the top that just says describe the problems with the windows. This part of the test or the, the answer rather is actually quite simple in the sense that the problems have already been given to us in the background information on the left. So you don't have to make them up. They're already there for you. So that eliminates a little bit of your, your detail or your imagination at work. 
So at some point, we're going to have to introduce the fact that our windows are poor, the, the noise from the streets coming in, and there is our, our cold gusts of air as well. So that part's pretty straightforward. But here's where we must put our imaginations to good work here. We must come up with a couple or three examples anyway of how these problems are affecting us. So think about if you want the manager to resolve the situation, we need to paint a very specific picture for them about how negatively these problems are affecting us. So they could be ways that these problems are affecting our physical health, maybe our mental health. So as we're talking right now, I'd like you to start thinking about how these, these issues could affect you. And I'll have you share them in the chat in just a moment. That last little bulleted point does ask us for uh, to come up with a problem to the solution. So we need to consider that too. So I think before we start typing out the email itself, you can see the three bulleted points now up top here. We want to consider the structure. How many paragraphs are we going to use? And I think this question actually follows a very similar structure to the one we looked at just earlier about the restaurant. So one way you could organize your work is in a four paragraph structure like we just did. So remember that first paragraph of any email will give a brief introduction to the background. So you're usually paraphrasing information from the test instructions itself. And then it gives a purpose statement. So again, looking at your three bulleted points up top, I think we could come up with our solution. Whatever it is we want our manager to do for us, I think we could ask that right in the first paragraph. That would reflect the purpose for the rest of the email itself. You'll notice then that our second paragraph, we're describing both of the problems. So we want to give some info about the city noise and the, um, the cold air coming in. In a different paragraph now, we can talk about the problems to our health. And then finally, your summary conclusion. So emphasizing what we've been talking about and then asking for a next step, probably leaving your contact details as well. So that's one very classic way you could organize your work or you could still keep a four paragraph structure, but you could change it up just a little tiny bit. So paragraphs one and four are the same. You're still going to introduce and give your purpose at the beginning. You're still going to summarize and provide contact details in the end. But you'll notice our middle paragraphs, we've just changed the order a little bit. So paragraph two now might talk about just the city noise. We can establish you know, what kinds of noises we're hearing and how it's a problem, how it's affecting us. And then in the next paragraph, paragraph three, we can then focus just on that second problem of the cold air and again, talk about its effects. So there are often different ways or several ways you could organize your work. You have to pick a method that works for you and you have to decide quickly. You don't want to spend 10 minutes just sorting this out. You want to get right to the writing. So again, spend a minute or two to gather your thoughts and then you'd start typing away. So that's our, our sort of introduction to our format for emails and also our paragraphing. But I'd really like to focus on this for the next little bit. Our content details are really, really important. So you'll see here that the number of ideas we include in our email will garner part of our score. And the number of details for the email, again, I think is pretty straightforward because those three bulleted points tell you what specifically you have to write about. Describe the problems, describe the effects, ask for a solution. So we know we basically have those three main ideas, but we're going to earn a higher score, hopefully a level nine or even higher, by offering many different specific examples and supporting details. Again, so when we say there's noise coming in, it's very general. What types of noises are we hearing? So these are the types of details we're going to add in just a moment. So the more description, the more specific the information, the more interesting, the higher the quality of the answer. And that's partly what the raters are looking for when they give you a score. Now, if we organize our work as we just laid out following that structure, that four paragraph structure, and as long as we make sure that all of our ideas stay on topic and connect one to the next, our coherence should, uh, should be fairly strong. Coherence is, again, how well the entire piece flows together. So we're going to work on that right now. And I'd like to focus on method two for organization. I think I'd like, I'd feel more comfortable anyway. It's more my writing style perhaps, but I'd like to look just at the city noise and its effects in one paragraph, and then we'll focus on the cold air and its effects in another. So with that in mind then, let's start right now generating ideas as a group. So our background information, once again, is pretty straightforward. We're going to say something about the noise coming in and the cold air coming in. So that will be our opening sentence. 
but I need right now a purpose. What I'm asking all of you to perhaps suggest right now in the live chat is how do we want the manager to resolve this? Can you think of something logical that we could ask the manager to do to fix these windows for us? So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that. Share your ideas when you're ready and Neil can hopefully read some of them out. Um, I've got my own idea in mind as well. Hopefully Neil's thinking this through as well too. But yeah, there are maybe a couple of things we could ask them to do for us. But what's, what's one reasonable request we could make of our manager? What could they possibly do to fix this issue so the noise isn't troubling us anymore? And we don't have those cold gusts of air. Can anyone suggest an idea here today? So we've got a good uh, suggestion from Rahul in the chat who has suggested that we get those windows repaired. Fantastic. Re you could ask for a repair. That's one method or one uh, suggestion, resolution. Or you could ask for the windows to be replaced. I know those words are similar, but this for my, well, the way I'm thinking about this is if we get them replaced, think about what we want the new windows to be like. So again, as we're typing our opening statement there in our paragraph one, if we just say, please repair our window or please replace our window. It's a logical request, it makes sense. And it checks off the third bulleted point here, but we're going to add more detail now. We're going to be more specific. So if we repair or replace these windows, what do we want the new windows to look like? What features will the new windows have that will prevent the noise and the air from coming in? Can we've, we got a great, we've got a great suggestion in the chat uh, right on that cue to make them soundproof. Yes, and how do we make them soundproof? Keep going, I'm pushing you in that direction. <laughs> Excellent suggestion, but how? And I know I'm not, a, I'm not, not good with building. <laughs> But I can think of a few ways maybe we could make them soundproof. What could we do? They get the new buildings going up in the cities. How are those windows constructed nowadays? The modern ones? What, how are they different from the old buildings like what I live in? Right. So we've got uh, another suggestion to make them more reliable. That's a, that's, a good, that's a good point. Okay. How? How are the windows going to be more reliable? So we're almost there, but not quite. Let's talk about the glass. What on earth could we do to the glass to keep the sound out or the noise out or to keep the air out? Like the, my new windows have are such, but what could be done to improve the quality of the glass so that they are soundproof, do you think? Any suggestions? So we've got uh, a suggestion on sliding windows. Okay, I'm thinking, I'm just gonna share what I, I know because my friend just moved into a new apartment in one of the modern buildings downtown. So this is what I was thinking. All of the windows in that building are being constructed with either double or triple pane glass. So the, the pane, the window pane or the glass itself is being made much thicker. So that's helping to keep a lot of the noise out because these buildings are going up right in the middle of the downtown core. So again, when you're thinking of your details, I'd encourage you to rely on personal experience or knowledge of, of other people. Uh, and so and that's where that idea came to me. Sliding windows might help, but I'm still thinking about those gusty drafts of air. So could we maybe do something about resealing the frames? So if we're repairing or even replacing those windows outright, if we could reseal them, put new seals so it, it, it creates that buffer so that there's no crack and there's no draft either. So these are the types of specific details that I'm hoping you're going to start including in the writing. Anyway, we've talked about lots of ideas, so you, you have choice. I mean, there's more than one way to do this but I'm just going to quickly show one way that you might write your opening paragraph. So we'll start off with the greeting up top, pretty standard. It says, attention building manager. Now you might know the name of your manager if, it's, if you've got some sort of a personal relationship. And if so, that would be okay. I would still use a Mr. or Ms. just to be pol uh, polite, professional, but building manager in this case might work as well. You'll notice I've got a, a colon, a dot dot. And that's because to me, the tone of this message is a lot more formal. I am asking for new windows anyway, so this is not a personal friendly email. So to have that more formal, serious approach, we can use a colon, and that's what we've done here. So it says, the windows in my apartment are letting in loud noises and cold drafts of air from the street below. So that's my opening. Here's my request. I'm writing to request that my windows be replaced with thicker glass and new seals to make my apartment more comfortable. Yeah, so we don't wanna just say, please make them soundproof. We want to say, make them soundproof by installing windows with thicker glass to keep the noise out or what have you. 
So we're going from a good answer, soundproof's a good answer, and we're taking it up a notch. We're making them soundproof by making that glass thicker. Let's continue on that way. So this is it. This is your first paragraph done. I think it's pretty, um, your opening is usually quite short in an email anyhow. A couple sentences will do it, just like so. So let's transition down to paragraph two at the bottom. We're going to focus on the city noise. So yes, we'll announce first in our opening that noise is a problem, but now we want to add those specific details. So can I have some of you start thinking about specific examples of noise you would hear from the street? So this will be hopefully pretty easy. If you, again, I live right downtown in Vancouver myself. So yeah, I sometimes experience a lot of that. So I have tons of examples up here of the types of noises I hear on a daily basis. What about the rest of you? If you live in a noisy area, think about what you hear. And if you don't, like Neil, you live in a pretty, pretty rural area, right? It's pretty quiet. Yeah, I live in the middle of the woods. It's pretty Ooh. quiet. <laughs> so if you're like Neil, and I envy that sometimes, you'll have to use your imagination. So you'll have to imagine you live in a very busy, busy neighborhood. Yeah, so we're getting lots of great suggestions. So right. the sound of an ambulance, Perfect. Yep. car horns, yep. traffic. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, good. I sometimes unfortunately hear people shouting or fighting in the street below too. Uh, what else do I hear? Sometimes, oh yeah, car horns, uh, sometimes even squawking birds. Uh, there's a big tree out front my my place and sometimes the birds all converge on it and oh my gosh, they're very noisy and so on. So when you're typing away, you're not going to have time to list, you know, six examples of noise alone, nor will you have the word count. You've only got 200 words, but I think if you could throw in even a couple examples of the types of noise, that's going to be very helpful to make the response more detailed and more interesting as well. If we're extra fancy, we could even throw in the neighborhood where we live. So again, if this for me, I might just say living so close to the English Bay in, in downtown Vancouver, you know, because that's a very noisy neighborhood at times. So add your details as you see fit as well. Okay, so now that we know what types of noise we're hearing, can we address the other half of this? How are those noises negatively affecting us in our day-to-day -day experiences here living? Can you think of some negative effects? Could be physical, could be mental. What other ideas maybe? So let's think on that. You're hearing ambulances blare by all day long or cars honking or people yelling. How does that eventually affect you as you're trying to enjoy yourselves? We had a good response from Rahul uh, earlier who had said that our sleep may be affected. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can probably extend that further. If you can't sleep, then you likely are uh, fatigued the next day and you might not be able to concentrate on important work projects or day-to-day -day errands and so on. Exactly. Yeah. So again, you see how one idea often sort of snowballs into another. So that's what you want to have happen on this test for sure. So can't sleep, maybe headaches, right? If we're constantly listening to these sirens, maybe we're getting really bad headaches. That's not fun. Uh, if you're sleepy, maybe you're irritable and it's negatively affecting your relationships and so on. So these ideas hopefully will come to you as you start writing. So come up with a few examples and then move on. Okay, I'll show you what one possible paragraph might look like using some of these ideas we've talked about. So this one says, our building overlooks the Georgia Viaduct where you can hear honking horns and police sirens all day. Even when my windows are closed, the city noise is loud, making it difficult to relax. Replacing my current windows with double pane glass would reduce the amount of noise entering my suite and allow me to enjoy a calmer environment. Okay, so two things. We've got some great examples here of the types of noise and, and how it's difficult for us. But you'll notice here once again that we've emphasized our request with what we want done to the windows. So here we're saying if we get double pane glass, it would help keep the noise out. And that's following or connecting back to our purpose statement up here where we first asked to have windows replaced with thicker glass. So we sometimes by, um, by emphasizing those points throughout your work, it actually strengthens that coherence factor. It's making everything smoothly flow together, which is part of the score too. Okay, so paragraph two is done for now. Let's move on to paragraph three at the bottom here. So now we're thinking of the cold air. So cold air is cold air. We're going to establish, hey, it's cold outside. The air is coming in. Can we be more specific and make it like an emergency case for our manager? So can we perhaps suggest even how cold is it? You might say recently we're in a cold snap. Temperatures have been well below zero or there have been three major snowstorms in Vancouver this year alone. 
So it's been uh, extra cold for this season. So if you could give one detail to really show your manager how important it is right now to get these windows fixed, I think you'll have much more success in having them listen to you. So that's one thing. Can we talk about the negative effects now? So if that cold air is constantly coming in and you're freezing all day long, can we first of all think about the physical effects it might have on the body? I mean, I know you can put a sweater on, but still imagine um, I work from home. So imagine sitting here freezing all day long. What does that do to the body eventually? Are there any health conditions we could make up or not make up, but like that we know of that would be a result of the, the cold weather maybe we could bring in? What comes to mind? Think about your own experiences or think about people you know. We've got a cough and cold is a big one. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, the cold weather coming in and drafts gives us, sometimes makes us sick and so on. I'm thinking about, I used to work in a senior's home. So again, my ideas go back to my own personal experience. When I was a teenager, it was my first job and I loved it. And a lot of the residents there, of course, in the colder weather, their arthritis really bothered them. So particularly in the hands. So that just struck me as something I could bring in as well. So again, the details you include don't have to be true in real life for you. But that would be a really specific detail to say, you know, when it's this cold, my uh, my joints are arthritic and and they're extra painful. So that could be something you could include other than just physical health. Can you think of other negative side effects of the cold weather outside coming into the suite? What do you do inside to your thermostat when it's freezing outside? Right. Most of us crank that heat up because it's just so frigid outside. So if you've got your thermostat on high for most of the day for several days on end, Think about what happens to your hydro bill, your electricity bill at the end of the month. It's going to be very expensive. So this is another example you can draw in. And if you're extra assertive, you might make a case to your building manager to say, if we could reseal these windows to prevent the air from coming in, you know, it would save the building money in the long run because they wouldn't have to heat so much the lobby areas and the common rooms. So again, I think one uh, persuasive method, particularly when we're almost communicating in a business sense this way is to really establish methods that will also benefit the reader, not just us. And it's more likely that they'll take us seriously if they can save money in the long run. So that's just something I thought of as well. Anyway, let's have a look at how these ideas might, might work in, in sentence form. So I'm basing this on Vancouver just because that's where I live right now. So it says Vancouver's weather has also been quite cold this year with temperatures well below freezing. The current seals around my window frames are old, allowing cool air to enter my apartment. Turning up the thermostat sometimes helps, but would really increase my heating bill during winter. Resealing the window frames would prevent drafts and save on heat, which are the ideal outcomes. Okay, so again, we've established how cold it is. We've established a major problem. We've emphasized again our request for the, for the repair or the replacement of these seals. So resealing the window frames follows along with what we initiated up here. So again, can you see the structure? So asking for thicker glass, talking about it here. Asking for new seals, talking about it here. This is one way or how writing flows together and strengthens coherence. So we've done paragraph three. Your summary, the last paragraph you write should be pretty short and also fairly easy to write. You're really just restating or summarizing the main points you were making above. And in this case, we were asking for new windows so that we can be more comfortable. So we're not freezing and we're not listening to noise all day long. So something like this would suffice, I think. You know, please let me know if new windows can be installed in my suite to create a quieter, warmer environment or call me at this number to discuss the matter further. So I think including a phone number here is helpful. We don't want to make the building manager have to go to their files and look our phone number up if they need to reach us. So let's make it easy for them. We'll include the phone number there. And then we sign off. Now you notice I've used the word here, sincerely. Sincerely is probably one of the most common sign offs, at least in Canadian um, culture for writing and, and so on and communication. You can never go wrong with sincerely. So I would encourage you right now to, to memorize this word. And if in doubt, this is a, a fail safe word you can always use in pretty much any written communication. You notice how we start the word with a capital S and then we put a comma after it. We leave one blank space and then we sign a name. So you can use your own name or you can make one up like I did here. It doesn't really matter. We just need a signature because that's prop a proper format. 
If you don't like the word sincerely, I think another common sign off would be the word regards. That's also a very common one. Okay, but don't get too fancy with your sign offs because sometimes if we if we veer off it, it gets a little bit convoluted. So again, stick to something very common. Sincerely or regards would, would be fine in this situation. Anyway, here is our entire email from start to finish. Another element of your score is your word count. So the raters, remember, are the instructions on the test said to write between 150 and 200 words. And our word count for this particular email is 194. So we've successfully fulfilled that other element that the raters are looking for. Okay, so again, looking back here now at all of the elements that the raters are looking for from us before they give us a score. We've just finished off talking all about our content details and putting in some specific examples. What I'd like to do to finish off today is I want to go through this email and proofread it as a group. We're going to read it back paragraph by paragraph, looking for ways to improve it. And I really want to focus on the vocabulary. I think what we've submitted so far works. I think it's a very good answer. But once we read it back, I'm hoping we'll find some instances where we can choose more interesting or higher level vocabulary words if we see some common or simple ones. We also want to make sure that we're not repeating the same words over and over. So a really strong uh, range is going to be helpful as well. So we'll do that now. Before we, we look back over at our work, I'm just going to mention that there are no grammar or writing mistakes today to worry about. I want us just to focus on the vocab and maybe even some sentence structure areas. Because again, to achieve that level nine, the readers really do want to see complexity from us. So that's what we're going to work hard to achieve right now. Okay, so I think what I should do first is remove the word count from the bottom of this email. Because once we start changing a few things, of course, that word count will be different. So let's just quickly look back at our opening paragraph. If you'd like to just skim read it yourself just really quickly and see if there are any details we could add in. I mean, I'm happy with the vocab here, to be honest, because we've just started and I think uh, I think it's very precise. But the one detail I guess I was thinking that's missing is when we mentioned about the windows in our apartment. I think it would be really helpful in this email to mention what apartment number we live at because there are so many suites in a building. And again, we don't want our manager to have to go to the files and look up our name and see where we live, make it easy for them, right? So let's add this little detail here. I think that just polishes off that opening. I don't see too much more we need to worry about there. But in the second paragraph, there are a couple of vocabulary things I'd like to really, really improve upon. So have a look for me, please. Maybe that first sentence, just read over that first sentence. And I'm going to suggest a couple of revisions here. So it currently says, our building overlooks the Georgia Viaduct where you can hear honking horns and police sirens all day. It's a nice detail with some specific description. What I'm questioning right now as I read this back is my verb choice when I said, you can hear. That to me is a little bit on the common or the simple side. So if I'm aiming for the highest score I can achieve, I think I'd like to come up with a stronger verb other than just hear. I can hear the, the cars honking. So what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to present for you another way to state this exact same idea. So you can see I've crossed out the words that we had before. You can still see them on screen. And the yellow highlighted sections here are words that I've added in. So instead of saying, where you can hear honking horns, we can now say where honking horns and ambulance and police sirens blare from early morning to late evening. So when we use that action word blare, that's a very precise and strong word that indicates intense noise. So even closing my eyes, I can imagine what that's like to have these incredibly loud sirens zipping by all day versus if I just said, oh, I can hear the sirens it loses its punch. It doesn't have that same strength behind it. So just by switching up our verb and, and rearranging, I guess, the way we've written it, I think it's a little, a lot, a lot stronger and more interesting. You'll notice too that we did say all day earlier. And instead of using a very common time marker like all day, why not be more specific? So from early morning to late evening, 
just, just so much more precise. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, I also added in ambulance. We just had police sirens earlier. So I said, oh, ambulance and police sirens, just to give a little bit of detail there. So that's the type of detail I'm hoping you'll play around with as you practice at home. Now, as we continue on our second sentence here, I see that I'm starting to repeat myself here. You know, the test instructions talked about loud noises, and I mentioned that up in my opening paragraph. So I don't want to keep using that same word over and over again. Can I ask any of you today maybe to come up with a different word that means the same as loud? Can you think of a synonym, something a little bit more interesting than just loud? So the city noise is, what's another word? And maybe Neil, you can think of, of some words too. <laughs> we'll share. I've got a good one to share, but I want to hear what you have to say first. <laughs> uh, I think deafening is a good one. I love that. The city noise is deafening. How strong is that, right? Like I can imagine how, how bothersome that is. Oh, the city noise is bothersome, you could say, I guess. Anything else we can think of? If anyone wants to drop something in the chat, feel free, obviously. Yeah, the city noise is... Now, when you're practicing at home, feel free to use your online dictionaries and thesauruses. This is how you're going to build vocab. You can't do that on the real test. But again, as you're practicing, this is how this is how you build it. Can I maybe introduce a word? I'm not sure we all know what this word is. So as I was thinking this through, I thought the city noise is intrusive. So if something is intruding on you, it's very, um, it's interrupting your whole day. So that's another interesting word choice. I think I like Neil's the best. I think if I could change this, I would say it's deafening. I love that. Yeah. Anything else so far? We got roaring, which I really like as well. I love it. The city noise is roaring. Yeah, fantastic. Um, can you, again, the point is, if you say the noise is loud, eh, it's kind of boring. It's kind of plain, isn't it? But the city noise is roaring so much more interesting. And that's what you'd like to do. Now, there's one more element to your vocab that I'd like you to consider. So I'm looking now at the last sentence here that says, replacing my current windows with double pane glass would reduce the amount of noise entering my suite. It's a great sentence, but I would like to add in what we call an adverb right there where I'm pointing. So the action, the verb is reduce. And oftentimes before we write the verb in a sentence, we can use an adverb that explains how much, how much are we reducing? These words usually end with an L-Y. So is there a word that pops into your mind that would make sense here? Share it in the chat if you'd like. Please make current as wood. Like really, really reduce. We don't want to say really. What's another good word? Uh, who's is? got a great one? Drastically. Yes. Would drastically reduce the amount of noise. I love it. You're on the right track. I thought of significantly. Those two words mean the same. Either or would work here. But again, leaving the adverb out doesn't make the response wrong. But by using these stronger verb choices and adding in these nice touches like adverbs, it's really elevating the quality of our vocab, as you can see. So I think that's a good way to go if you've got the vocab to do that. There's one more tiny little correction I'd love to make. And it happens in the very last line here, right here. So the word and is probably the most common word in English. So if you can avoid using it, I would encourage you to avoid it. Try something else. Technically right now, I guess we have almost like a compound sentence. I'm just going to take out the word and. I'm going to add a comma and change up the verb a little bit, allowing me to enjoy a calmer environment. So that whole sentence from front to, to end now uh, is actually a complex structure. So just by making that one change, it's just a little bit elevated, which is what we want to do. So something I'd point out. Okay, let's do one more paragraph. And this is going to be another good vocab exercise for all of you. So looking at paragraph three, I identified three words right here that I felt were a little bit too common or simple. They make sense and grammatically they're fine, but I think if we put our minds together, we can come up with better words. So it says here, Vancouver's weather has also been quite cold this year. What could we say instead of quite? Has also been, this is an adverb, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So how cold has it been? Um, to use, was it Raul's idea earlier of drastically? Has also been drastically cold, that might work here. Could we say unseasonably cold? 
something like that would definitely be better than quite, quite cold, right? Um, an easier one below that is cool, allowing cool air to enter my apartment. Cool doesn't give the punch I want. I want my manager to think of me as sitting here freezing, so I need better windows. So can we have a stronger, a stronger adjective choice there? What's another word for cool? A better word for cool air. <laughs> it's too simple. What do you think? Hmm. Cold probably doesn't cut it either. Neil, do you have any thoughtful words you might toss out? Well, we could say freezing if we want to really drive that point home. Yep, I think freezing would work. I don't know if my word is any better than that. I went with frigid because I was really trying to showcase a varied vocabulary. Does that make sense? Allowing frigid air, something frigid, it's absolutely freezing. Yeah. And other than that, I can't think of too many more words. Are there any suggestions in the chat box there? We've got uh, chili, which is a good one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Allowing chili air. I like it, actually. Good one. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So it's fun to share thoughts, thoughts like this because we often think of words that, you know, somebody else has not. So I like putting our minds together. Last but not least, let's let's get rid of that word really in the third line down. You know, turning up the thermostat sometimes helps, but would something increase my heating bill? Would I actually, I stole Raul's word. That's where I put drastically. You suggested that above. And I put it here. So drastically increase or significantly increase uh, would work there and so on. And likewise, we could even add another one here. You know, resealing the window frames would undoubtedly prevent drafts. So we're going really high level now. But this is how we use adverbs. We put them right before the action or right before the verb in the sentence. They're meant there to signify how the action's being done. So we've really punched up the, the image that our manager hopefully has of us freezing and needs to address this issue. And then our last paragraph, I think is fine. I mean, it's basically summarizing our main points and it gives our context. So I don't see too, too much we can do there. And again, our sign off. So our entire email now front to bottom or top to bottom. When we do a word count now, technically it comes into 201 words. And I know the test instruction said 150 to 200 words. But I uh, will also let you know that the raters are flexible and they will give you a 10% leeway. So you could go 10% below or above those word count limits and you would not lose marks. So technically, if you wrote anywhere in between 135 to 220 words, you'd be absolutely fine. I think aiming for about 200 is, is great. You know, that way it gives you enough words like we've added in those wonderful adverbs and some adjectives. So it, it allows you to showcase the vocab when you're closer to the 200 range. So we'll go with that. Okay, so as a time management plan, remember you take just a minute or so to gather your thoughts at the beginning and plan how many paragraphs. You'll spend most of your time drafting, just typing your answer out. But of the whole 27 minutes you've got to write this email on the test, I hope you save at least, say, three minutes at the end, even four if you can to read it back like we just did and look for opportunities to make it better. There are always a couple of word choices you can tweak to make it more interesting. Again, we've added in some adverbs and even created a few complex sentences. So just to wrap up, I guess what we did, always again, describe it or look at your organizational pattern, figure out how many paragraphs you'll need. And that's going to depend on how many bulleted points you have on the test. So how many main ideas are you talking about? Because they each go in their own paragraph. Always have very informative and interesting details. So in other words, what does your reader, in this case, the building manager, what would they need to know from you in order for you to get what you want out of the end of the day? So if you want that manager to replace your windows or to repair them, you have to make a pretty strong case that right now your windows are, are causing far too many problems. And I think we did a, a fairly decent job of that in our email today. Proofread your work. We're always looking for grammar mistakes to fix if we find them. Our vocabulary is what we've really focused in today's episode. So make sure it's as specific and varied as you possibly can. And of course, whenever you have an opportunity to make a more complex sentence structure, that's going to help with your score as well. And then last but not least, we did double check our word count to make sure that we fit that element because it does count for part of our score. All right, so that's that for today. I'm just going to exit my presentation here and I'm going to come back to you if I can find
find the right button. Here I am. <laughs> I'm back. So again, I always forget to announce when I start these episodes that I can't actually see the, the comments coming in live as I'm presenting. So I don't know if I've missed any questions from the audience here today, but if you do have any questions remaining, I'm happy to answer them now before we log off for the day. We did get a really great question earlier from Rahul, and I'm just going to pull that up. Sure. And that's if we can briefly describe the types of emails that might be expected on the test. Yeah, good. Okay, so I would say today's email, by the way, I would say was more of a almost like a semi-formal situation. So formality and language is sort of the professionalism and the tone. So if we're writing to a stranger or if we're writing to someone maybe we don't know that well, like your building manager, you probably have met them, but you probably don't interact with them on a friendly basis. So we're going to make sure that we're using language that always is respectful. We're not going to use slang or idiomatic language and so on. That would be far too casual. So, and that's another word for casual is informal as what Rahul has said. I would say if you look at our practice tests, again, we've got two free ones on, on our website and we have several episodes here on self Hip Live. You'll see that the vast majority of the task one writing email questions are going to use a similar tone to what we did today. Almost every single email question I've ever encountered myself as I teach these episodes asks you to usually write to some sort of a manager. So whether it's a building manager like today or the restaurant manager, like we saw in that first opening today, um, who else? Anyway, it's about the same level. So yeah, uh, grade your language or make sure you're using language that gets your point across confidently, but just take care not to ever sound bossy or rude or demanding, right? With your word choice. I don't think we did today. I think we had the right tone. And uh, yeah, and make sure, as I say to you, you're keeping it professional. Uh, don't ever address, like, don't ever say, hi, building manager, or hey, building manager. That's too informal. I don't foresee a reason on Selpip that you'd ever be doing that. So dear building manager, or even attention building manager, I chose that word today, and that sort of elevated the formality just a bit. But yeah, if, if today's level of formality makes sense to you, that's pretty much what most of your test questions will require of you. That being said, though, I have to qualify this. You always have to select your formality based on the question in front of you on the test. So I don't want to misguide anyone today and say 100%, it's always going to be like this. I can't predict what the next test question live will be down the road. So again, just make it your own best assumption based on who you're writing to. But it's probably going to be a manager or a stranger, I would say. Great question, Rahul. I'm glad you brought that up. I didn't really address the formality today. So it's nice to end today with that in mind. All right. <laughs> I think that's it. I think that's about it. We've got okay, some questions great. today. Yeah? Great, yeah, and you all had some really nice vocab today. I hope that you actually learned a few more words today as well, and you can tuck them into your vocab journals if you're keeping them. Thank you so much, Brandy. My pleasure. Keep warm out there. Again, it's still just snowing slightly out here, <laughs> so stay warm, yeah. and I'll see you next time I'm on. <laughs> all right, thanks, Brandy. Okay, so before we sign off for today, I'd just like to answer the trivia question that we posed at the beginning of today's episode, which is which province is in the center of Canada? And the answer to today's trivia question is Manitoba. So if you guys guessed Manitoba, congratulations. That was the correct guess. And lastly, before we sign off today, I would like to share that our uh, ongoing uh, uh, offer with the National Bank of Canada is still on. So that's where if you uh, take uh, open a new account, with uh, the National Bank of Canada, you can get up to $280 cash back to help pay for your CELPIP or your kale test. So you can find out more at nbc.ca slash CELPIP kale offer or visit our website where we've got that link posted right on our front page as well. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we'll see you on the next episode of CELPIP Live.